I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Oh, 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 little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm anxious, because you know who's coming? Oh, I certainly do. That little fat man with a little fat belly, who, when he laughs, shakes just like jelly. Yes, St. Nick. And I suppose you have a list from here to tomorrow of presents you want for Christmas. No, not that long. I don't want to be selfish and get all the toys. Now, that's the spirit. I like to see an unselfish child when Christmas comes around. Well, after all, you should be unselfish. St. Nick wasn't born just to be nice to one person. He was born to take care of all the boys and girls in the world and make them happy and bring each of them some toys. Well, I hope that Santa Claus brings you all the things you want. So do I. And one other thing I want, I hope you'll always keep reading the funnies to me. I'll see you next year. Oh, I certainly will. Now, now could we read the funnies today? Puck, the comic weekly? Yeah. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. Oh, I'm anxious to see what's happening to little Amos. The little mouse in Ben and Me? Yes. He had a quarrel with Benjamin Franklin, you know, and now they're not friends anymore, and I want them to make up. You think they will? Well, let's find out right away. So let's go past Beetle Bailey on the front page, who gets into trouble again, of course. Turn over that page. Go past little iodine on page two, past Prince Valiant on page three... Turn over page three, and here on page four is Walt Disney's Ben and Me. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Hickory dickory diddle dee dee, doodle some music for Ben and Me. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin and Amos had broken up their friendship. Ben had played too many tricks on Amos while experimenting with electricity. Now, this was in the early days of America when the English king had been ruling the American colonies unfairly and unwisely. Ben Franklin, who had become a famous man, was chosen to go to England to lay the complaints of the colonists before King George. And then came the day when Ben returned from England to report to the colonies. But let little Amos tell the story. Finally, Ben returned from England. I saw him walk down the gangplank from the ship. People crowded the dock, third deck to top row. Even though Ben had played some mean tricks on me, I did admire him and I couldn't help saying, Good old Ben. A big cheer went up. Hey, what did the king say, Ben? First picture, bottom row, Ben quieted the crowd. Gentlemen? My mission was a failure. The king was unreasonable. Wouldn't even listen. All right, then. We'll fight for our independence. War! Yeah, there has to be war! There has to be war! War! Now, war is a terrible thing. Ben raised his hand. War? But, gentlemen, there must be some other way. We gotta fight! What other way, Ben? What other way? We gotta fight! Ben. He walked off shaking his head. Hey, what'll we do, Ben? What'll we do? If I only knew. If I only knew. Poor Ben. I knew I could help him. I had a couple of ideas as usual. And so I started after him. But then, last picture, I stopped. I couldn't help thinking of the mean tricks he'd played on me. I folded my arms firmly and got a hold of myself. No, I couldn't go back. After all, a mouse has a little pride. Oh, my, I wish Amos had gone after Ben to help him. So do I. Ben needs Amos right now. Do you think? 
think Amos will go and help him and forget his pride? Well, a mouse's pride is a teeny-weeny little pride, so maybe he will forget it and help Ben. But we'll find out about that next week, maybe. Now look across the page. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes, and Roy's starting a new adventure. You'll bet he is. Last week, a train was going through the country where Roy lives. And the train was carrying men who were being taken to a jail. And as the train passed under the limb of a tree, an outlaw jumped onto the train from the limb. And he has a gun in his hand. I wonder what he's going to do. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. hi yip hi yo Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. hi yip hi yo <laughs> Working swiftly, the outlaw uncouples the last car from the rest of the train. The engine and the forward cars continue up the grade, and the last car, rolling free, begins to slow down. The outlaw climbs back under the platform and flings open the door. Hey, what's going on here? The outlaw steps in the door. Here's my calling card, guard. And the guard falls to the floor dead. The outlaw walks to a convict chained to one of the seats. All right, I got horses staked out near here, boss. Nice going, Grip. I knew you'd spring me. Hey, how about taking us along? Yeah, hey, take us along, too. Grid snatches on, the keys there. from the dead guard. Hey, come on, come on. Unlocks the handcuffs from his boss's wrist. Come on, be a sport. Good pal. Come on, I'm And the two to hurry back here. to the rear platform. Last picture, top row. So long, pals. You'll all be free when his car jumps the tracks at switchback curve. Hey, come on, Sparrow. The engineer will be coming back to find his lost car. <laughs> A few minutes later, a horseman comes around the bend, first picture bottom row. It's Roy Rogers. He sees the railroad car rolling back down the steep grade. Great Scott, Trigger, that's a runaway railroad car headed this way. Go, Trigger, go! Trigger darts across the ground, swift as a deer. In a second, he's beside the runaway car. Roy reaches over, pulls himself off onto the platform. You've got to stop it before it reaches switchback curve. Roy begins to apply the brakes. A short distance ahead lies the treacherous curve. If the car isn't stopped, over it'll go, killing all on board. Roy gives a final, desperate wrench. And the car comes to a stop. And then, last picture, unseen by Roy, the main part of the train comes backing down the slope. On the rear platform are two guards, one with a rifle aimed at Roy. The other guard says, Hey, look, there's the man who uncoupled the car. Let him have it. coming to rescue the other convicts, and they're going to shoot him. It looks that way. And Roy doesn't even know there are convicts in the car. How can he possibly ever tell them that before they shoot? I don't know, and we can only hope that he'll be able to do it. Or maybe we'll find that out next week. But now let's go to the very last page of the first section, and here we are with Donald Buckle. Oh, my favorite, favorite. And we'll read your favorite, favorite right now. Say the magic words with me. Squeegee jump, squeegee jump, squeegee chicka chack. Like sad music to better quack quack. Donald has a pet parakeet named Chip. Chip scoot, Chip scoot. Donald opens the cage to feed Chip. Oh boy! And out of the cage, Chip flies. Hi, Chip. Come back here. But Chip is sitting on the lamp. Donald walks over. Come on, Chip. Hop on my finger. Uh-huh. Now, last picture top row, Chip goes out the window. Donald leaps out the window after him. First picture, second row. Come, Chip. Kill Chip. 55 Benjamin, 244 Furlong Street. And Chip's on the mailbox. Of all the... Chip, want a cracker? Nice, Chip. Come. 55 Brinkman Blue, 44 Furlong, here. And Chip is in a tree. Last picture, second row, Donald shinnies up the tree. Kill <laughs> <laughs> Chip. Come to Uncle Donald. All right. Says Horatio, the hurricane's upon us. And Chip is on the housetop. <laughs> and Donald is on the housetop. All right. And Chip leaps to the chimney, with Donald after him. Down the hatch, Herman. Down the hatch. 
and down the chimney Chip goes, with Donald after him. <coughs> and last picture, there's Chip sitting in the birdcage. Rock! Chip's cute! And there lies Donald in the fireplace. Chip's cute! All covered with soot. Chip's cute! And a bump on his head. Chip's cute! Cute, my aching head! <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yes. Chasing the bird everywhere and ending up down the chimney. And getting himself all messed up and finding his little parakeet in the cage. Yes. But you know, I think I think that parakeet is cute. Yes, so do I. But Donald doesn't think so. No, Donald doesn't think so. Doesn't he look mad? Yes. Now it's time to pick up the first page of the second section. Oh, yes. What funny thing does Dad would do today? Well, let's find out right now. Here we go on the first page of the second section. Section of Puck the Comic Weekly with Dagwood and Blondie. Ram a food, am a fum, zim zam zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood has been thinking, and suddenly a bright idea bursts into his mind. Blondie, I've thought up a formula that will outstone the scientific world. He dashes into the kitchen where Blondie's making supper. If it works, it'll make the atomic and the hydrogen bombs obsolete. Yes, dear. But now let me finish getting supper ready. Last picture top row, Dagwood is coming out of the drugstore, his arms loaded with bottles of chemicals. Wives never seem to be enthusiastic when their husbands get these world-shattering ideas. First picture, second row, he's in the bathroom, busy mixing up his chemicals. Visitors from all over the world will someday visit this laboratory I've set up in our bathroom. <laughs> Meanwhile, downstairs, Blondie's on the back porch trying to find her children. Yoo-hoo! Alexander! Cookie, come to supper! And she hears... Cookie! Alexander! Come to supper! And again she hears... Oh, last picture, second row, Blondie is putting on her coat and going down the walk. It makes me so mad when they don't come when I call them. Now I'll have to go out and get them. First picture, third row, she's found Cookie and Alexander playing in a vacant lot. Alexander, come this minute. I've called you ten times. And Blondie drags the kids home. I'm going to show you how quickly your daddy comes when I call him to supper. <laughs> Last picture, third row, upstairs in the bathroom, Dagwood is adding the final test to his experiment. Now for the big test. Everything depends on how these acids act when I mix them. At that moment, first picture, bottom row, Blondie calls up the stairs. Dagwood, come to supper. And from the bathroom... And out sails Dagwood. And there he lies, last picture at Blondie's feet. Blondie turns to the two children. Now, hereafter, I want you to come as quickly as that when I call you. <laughs> Wasn't that funny? <laughs> yes, Dagwood working in the bathroom, building up to a big experiment, and then when Blondie calls him... <laughs> And there he is in front of her on the floor. Yes, and Blondie thinks it's because she called him. <laughs> oh, those bumpsteads are funny. Yes, those bumpsteads are funny. Well, now let's turn over the page. Oh, look, here's Flash Gordon. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again on the second page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly with Flash Gordon. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. A rigga rigga doon doon saskamatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash is on the strange planet Callisto, the only Earthman there. He's discovered that all of the people on the planet are ruled by a mysterious thing or person who is never seen. With the aid of a hermit named Philo and Rosini, a clown, Flash has been trying to find this person called the Mind. While searching in the castle, Flash fell through a trap door into a dark dungeon where he heard loud laughing. He turned on his spotlight to see where the laughter came from, and suddenly a voice screams, Put out that light! 
And up above in the throne room, the captives whose minds are controlled by the leader who think as he does begin to scream. But Rosini, the clown, has his own reaction. Light, that's it. Flash has found the mind and his weakness. And he heads for the door, last picture top row. I must tell Philo about this. And down in the cavern again, first picture, bottom row, Flash moving his light about, thinks to himself, that was no voice screaming. It was a powerful mental message. The mind. He's in this cavern somewhere. And then Flash moves forward. All right, Mr. Mind. I know you're nearby. And you can't stand this light. You're panicky. I can feel it. Maybe you know you're in real trouble. Closer and closer, Flash walks toward the opposite bank of the underground river. Then suddenly, last picture. Drop the light! Sorry, Mind. But you don't do so well when you're in panic. I'm still master of my own will. And I'm coming after you. Oh, good. Flesh has discovered the secret of the mind's weakness. Yes, he has. The mind can't stand light. Do you think that Flesh is getting closer to the mind now? I think so, and I'm sure we'll find that out next week. But now let's go past the Lone Ranger on page three, turn over that page, and here on page four, under the Little King, is our old friend, Uncle Remus. Oh. Favorite. And we'll read Uncle Remus right now. Here we go with Uncle Remus and his tales of Brer Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, hoppity make, make it a habit, habit to give us music for old Brer Rabbit. rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says, Yes, sir. Old Brer Bar sees the bright and the dark side of everything. Yes, Brer Bar usually does, he thinks. And on one bright sunny day, as Brer Bar's out for a stroll, he passes Brer Rabbit's place. He sees Brer Rabbit wheeling a load of hay in his wheelbarrow. Brer Rabbit is wearing dark glasses like anybody does on a sunny day. Uh, uh hey, Brer Rabbit, uh, how come you is uh, wearing them dark glasses? Brer Rabbit's so amused at such a silly question that he teases Brer Bar. Oh, um, uh, these glasses is made for seeing in the dark. The no fun, huh? Yes, sir. Uh, Brer Rabbit, uh, how comes uh, you wants to see in the dark? Well, because it helps me to get faster to where I was going. Last picture, top row, Brer Bar is really curious. Uh, how about uh, letting me try out them dark glasses? Huh? Okay, if you can find some dark. First picture, bottom row, Burr Bar looks into the barn. The door is open, and inside, of course, it's dark. Well, inside that barn is the full of dark. And suddenly, Burr Bar lowers his head and makes a lumbering rush. Hey, Burr Bar, not far. Hey, wait, stop. But it's too late. From inside the barn... And a minute later, Brer Bar staggers out of the barn. I see them, boy. I see them. You see what? Last picture. Brer Bar points all around him. I uh, see stars. Well, there you is. Them dark glasses work. And Uncle Remus says... It don't take much to please ignorance. Oh, oh that Br'er Bar is certainly stupid. Yes, Br'er Rabbit teases him a little by saying dark glasses are made to see in the dark. And Br'er Bar believes him and runs into the barn to see what he can see in the dark. Uh, he found out. <laughs> yes, look at the bumps all over him where he bumped into everything. Yeah. And he's still so dumb that he thinks the stars he sees from his pain are stars he can only see with the glasses. Oh, he's some fellow. <laughs> yes, he's some fellow. Well, now let's go to the very last page of the Comic Weekly. And here we go with Dick's adventures. Oh, yes, and Dick is in the early days of America. 
And you remember that he and his uncle Derek had been captured by the Indians. Yes, they've been captured by the Indian chief named Osceola, who's been defying the United States government. I wonder what's going to happen to Dick now that he's a prisoner of the Indians. Well, let's read and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Riggity pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Convinced that only by the utmost patience and luck can they hope to escape, Dick and Dr. Derrick pretend complete obedience to Osceola. In the gathering dusk, the Seminole raiding party has halted near a stockade which holds a gang of frontier bandits who were caught pillaging the Georgia countryside. Now it's time to attack. And last picture top row, awaiting nightfall, Osceola imposes absolute silence. Then, heavily armed, he and his warriors creep through the darkness. As the others creep off in the darkness, first picture, second row, Dick looks closely at the man left behind to guard them. He sees with astonishment... Why, you're no Indian at all. Indian? Not me. I was tossed into that stockade for... Well, never mind for what. But Osceola set me free. Last picture, second row. The bandit goes on. Maybe I'm guilty and maybe not. Osceola don't care nothing about that. He's fighting his own battle to keep from being pushed out of his land in Florida. And all of us from the stockade is going to fight on his side. That's Osceola's price for freeing us. And seeing the look on Dick's face, First picture, bottom row. The bandit has a change of heart. Now, hey, listen, I... I don't like these engines any more than you do. But I gotta play along. At least until Osceola opens the gates of the stockade for my pals. <coughs> hey, listen. There. Won't be long now. Last picture... Osceola, followed by his Indians and a ragtag group of men, come toward them. The sky is alight with flames from the burning fort. A band of freed bandits is swarming around, wild with joy. The guard whispers to Dick. You can trust me. My name's Jim. I'll get you out of this somehow. Stick close to me. Dick and his uncle have found a friend. Yes, that can make all the difference. It's too bad he couldn't let Dick go now. Oh, but if he did, I'm sure that Dick couldn't get away with all those Indians around him. Oh, oh no, I guess you're right. It might be better to wait until there's a better chance. Yes, we'll just have to trust this man who's promised to help. That looks like a rough bunch of men that Osceola has freed from that fort, or whatever you call it. Yes, they do. I wonder what they're all up to. Well, we'll find out more next week. But now, look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. And I'm so anxious to see how this is going to turn out because, you remember, Rusty's been arrested for stealing some pearls that he didn't steal at all. That's right. And when the case came to trial, that lawyer against Rusty called two men to the witness stand and they said that they saw Rusty coming out of the room where the pearls were stolen. But Rusty's lawyer did a very smart thing. He dressed two jockeys so they looked just like Rusty and he had them stand with their backs to the door. And then the door was opened. And the lawyer asked the electrician and the carpenter, who had testified against Rusty, to point out which one was Rusty. And they pointed to the boy on the right. And when the lawyer had the boys turn around, they saw that neither of them was Rusty. Yes. Now I wonder what will happen. Will the judge believe that Rusty couldn't have stolen the pearls now? Well, we'll find that out in a minute. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Now Mr. Tyndall calls Rusty to the stand, and the moment has come to hear Rusty's story. Mr. Tyndall sympathetically begins. Now, Rusty, when did you leave the theater the day of the robbery? And uh, what were you wearing? Well, well I, I left just about three o'clock, sir, and I was wearing the stable boy costume Mr. Figsley gave me. You see, I, I was going to get Patty to sew on a missing button. I see. You were not wearing your regular jacket and red cap. 
N no, sir. Where were they? Why, why, I left him in Mr. Grant's dressing room where, where I was supposed to dress. And Rusty goes on, last picture, top row. Then I, then, I, then I started home with the horse, but when I reached the dirt road, well, there was a trailer that was stuck there in the mud. <laughs> There's a strange interruption for the court trial, and the judge speaks up. Oh, one moment, bailiff. Um, see what that disturbance is. The bailiff goes to the door. And there stands Rusty's friend Stovepipe with Jerry, the man from the carnival who has a dog act. The man that Rusty was helping at the time the pearls were being stolen. The bailiff tries to stop Stovepipe from entering, but Stovepipe brushes him aside. Gangway, minion of the law. We are about to tip the scales of justice. Stand aside. Last picture, the judge rises. And what is the meaning of this outrage? Rusty's lawyer, Mr. Tyndall, explains. I crave the court's indulgence, sir. This is my missing witness who can corroborate Rusty's testimony. Stovepipe bows to the judge. My esteemed friend here has come at personal sacrifice to uphold the cause of justice. I, I gotta keep Flish and Plum with me in account of the IQ. It's so high, I have a nervous breakdown if I left him alone. Golly, it's Mr. Stovepipe and the dog man. Oh, hooray, hooray, hooray. Stovepipe finally got there with Jerry, and he's the one man who can tell everybody that Rusty couldn't have stolen the pearls. That's right, because Rusty was with Jerry when the pearls were being stolen. And now Rusty will be free. Yes, we hope he will. Next week, we'll find out. And I wonder, will Tex and his detective friend catch the real crook? Well, we'll find that out next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Greedy Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs>